the business judgment rule is the fundamental principle behind the duty of care. Essentially, the business judgment rule presumes that a director or officer of a company is acting with the company's best interest and is not subject to a fairness review, uh, which is a very difficult standard to overcome, if that person is informed. And that wasn't taken very seriously until the Van Gorkum case. So your Wrigley case is going to be your uh, kind of, uh, if you will, uh, baseline. But Van Gorkum was the case that really shook the corporate world and, and really shook up corporate practice because it, it had such a huge impact on how people uh, acted afterwards. What we're going to focus on here why they wanted to change their business structure and what kind of process they should have gone through to do that. So, so TransUnion had an unusual kind of tax problem. They had some kind of tax credits. When you make profit, you owe taxes on that profit, but you can offset that with losses that you incurred within a certain period of time. I think currently it's with a five-year carry forward. So you can't use those credits forever. They expire after some point if they're a corporation. Depends on the type of the credit. So these, but anyway, these are credits that you can offset against your income, but they will expire at some point. Now it's a real shame to lose those credits. They can be very valuable. And so those losses you took on in early years, whether that was, it, I guess it was because they own a lot of stuff. When you own stuff and you're a business, you show a book loss because that, that, that equipment, in this case it was uh, rail cars, depreciates over time. So they were leasing out these rail cars, and, and the presumption that the IRS makes is that an asset depreciates over time on some fixed schedule, meaning it's worth less today than it was last year. And we all know that from owning our own personal vehicles, right? I mean, every time we you know, check the Kelly Blue Book value in our car, it always goes down. It never goes up. It's not quite like a house. And rail cars were similar. And what's interesting about IRS depreciation is it has nothing to do with real value. Something about book value. So the cars might be worth much more than they're shown on paper. But the company is showing these losses that they take every year on a schedule called a depreciation schedule. And as a result, they have all of these losses that they could apply against taxable income, but they don't have an act enough income to wipe it out. So they're going to lose these tax credits. And so TransUnion uh, uh, thinks about what are they going to do about it. So. What are some options that the TransUnion management thinks about in terms of how they're going to deal with this very um, unusual problem of, of too much losses that are going to expire? I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with losses, right? What can you do with you can You can deduct them from your revenue. So what are some ways that a company could Im increase its revenues? I mean, you could sell the asset, and then you would have some kind of gain from that sale because right, you actually have cash coming in, and you no longer are taking a loss, so that will prevent some of your losses, so potentially could, could sell some assets. Now this company, what kind of financial situation were they in? Were they doing well? Were they doing poorly? Were they heavy on debt? Were they light on debt? They had very minimal debt. They had a ton of cash. So if you have a ton of cash and not much debt, you can buy things. Right? You probably experienced this yourself. I'm not in that position right now. I have very little cash and debt, so I don't buy much. You know, that's why I'm wearing the same pants most of the time. At least in the winter, you know. I mean, the corduroys. How many pair of corduroys, you know, can a guy afford, really? So this is a company, in a, this company can afford all the corduroys that they could ever, ever dream of, right? And then some. They could, in fact, buy an entire other company. They have so much money, they could probably buy a company outright, a company that's profitable. And they could probably get a loan, since they're in such a good debt position, right? I mean... I mentioned about the credit score thing, but you know, I don't, banks want to give me any more, any more of their money right now until they pay down the house. On the other hand, this is a company with a lot of cash coming in, a lot of revenues, established company, has real assets, a bunch of rail cars, so you could probably get a loan, buy a company. Now you have some debt on the books, you know, you're going to be, uh, you know, uh, paying for that debt and potentially could drive up your revenues uh, from there. One other thing TransUnion could maybe do with all that cash is pay some lobbyists to go to Washington and convince Washington to pay them for their unused tax credits. Or the company could sell itself to a company that, has, uh, that needs the losses. So think about it like this. TransUnion is making $20 million a year, and they have $100 million of losses. So they're essentially not paying any taxes. 
But if these losses, if these credits are going to expire, they're not getting that much mileage out of it. So the value of TransUnion to itself might be lower than the value of TransUnion to a company that could make better use of those losses. That was the thinking here. If we can sell our TransUnion company, we're going to sell the company and its losses, and some other company can enjoy those losses. So they'll pay us, and we're more, worth more to them than they are worth to us. The company could also potentially sell itself to management or a variety of other, a variety of other options. With all of those options, we need to talk a little bit about the people involved because this is about humans at the end of the day. I mean, it doesn't feel that way sometimes. I've tried hard, I don't know how successful it's been, to make corporations a little more human, right? With the corporate social responsibility. There are people behind this, and in this case, there are people who are liable to be sued. So who were the cast of characters involved in this case? Well, they're kind of interesting people, actually, and, and it, it turns out that it matters who they are because we're determining whether or not these characters fulfilled their duty of care that they owe to the shareholders of this company. First we have our buddy Jerome Van Gorkum. So this is the main man. This is our star of the show. Jerome Van Gorkum was 62 years old at the time of this and he was planning to retire. I want you to think about why that might matter. I'm putting it up there because it does matter. So what's that fact about? How do we use that fact to issue spot here? He's leaving the company. He, the shareholder is staying on. He's leaving. Maybe he's trying to cash out. Right? So one thing we should flag right away, we got a CEO going out the door. Well, I mean, you ever heard of you know, the term like lame duck president? Got your lame duck CEO here. He may not have the right interests in mind. I mean, that president going into their third year looking for re-election, I mean, you better believe they're out there shaking hands, kissing babies, blah, blah, blah. They're not kissing any babies on like their 700th day of the presidency, right? They're like packing up and trying to figure out where they're going to build their library or whatever you do when you're not present anymore. Similarly here, this is someone who might be uh, on his way out. And so that's our friend Jerome Van Gorkum, looking to retire, very illustrious storied career, veteran. On the other side of our table is we have a potential buyer, a man named J. Robert Pritzker. And this, at the time, was one of the richest people in the world. He was a venture capitalist, a philanthropist, a private business owner, and he got this money from Hyatt Hotels, which he inherited, and he's also, interestingly, from Illinois. So this is, a, this is a fabulously wealthy guy. He's an heir to the Hyatt fortune, and he runs this private equity and venture capital group. But no, these are sophisticated people. On the one hand, certified public accountant, an attorney. On the other hand, one of the wealthiest men in America, heir to a fortune, uh, runs a venture capital company, and they have a meeting. Before I get to the meeting, actually, what did Van Gorkum do before the board even met? He asked the controller, to calculate whether or not they could have a leverage buyout at $55 a share, and then meets with Jay Pritzker, who specializes in leverage buyouts on the money side of things, to see if he would be interested in buying the company. Now, when this happened, what was the stock price? The stock price was $38 a share, and Pritzker offered $55 a share. So, question, isn't that a lot more? I mean, shouldn't that be enough? He's offering to pay a lot more than the share price. Shouldn't that be, well, I mean, wouldn't anybody want that deal? So, Pritzker and Van Gorkum get into this uh, negotiations without the board. What other, what, what fact does that bring up? If you're thinking about, again, issue spotting, about duty of care of the board, on the one hand, you've got a CEO who's 62 and out the door and might be conflicted and might be looking to, to sell the company and you know, get something different than his shareholders. And now you see that he's going behind the board's back. These are all things that give the board reason to doubt the CEO's credibility. Right? So those are all facts that point to that. All right, so can Bell Gorkum sell the company alone? No. Right? You know that. You know that because you learned about authority last semester. You can't sell this company without the board. So who is this board? Who is sitting on this board? The board is no slouch. And you might think, in fact, I'm sure Van Gorkum thought, and the outside counsel in the room thought, these are not the kind of people you pull the wool over their eyes too easily. And let's take a list of this cast of characters, right? The board member consists of the dean of Chicago's MBA program and the chancellor of the University of Rochester, a lawyer who is also a CEO, 
a CEO CPA who's the director of American Steel, a massive corporation. Uh, Graham Morgan, a, you know, a chemist, a PhD chemist, a CEO of a major American company, U.S. Gypsum. Uh, Robert Renneker, Harvard MBA, CEO of Swift and Company, and a director of their board. Right? These are all outside directors. They're not employees. These are major power players. They're not the kind of people that are easily tricked or duped. We have some inside directors as well. They like to stay employees. And you know what? If you're COO and president of a major company generating huge revenues, you're probably making a big salary. You're probably enough to afford as many corduroys as you want and sport jackets to boot. Probably pay off your car, any car, right? And so these people want to keep their jobs. So there is an inherent conflict with the employees. So just part of this is to paint the picture of these, of these board dynamics. But these are people not easily duped, and they have a meeting. That's good, right? I mean, we're going to see, a case, we're going to see some cases where people don't even bother with the meeting, right? That, that's not so good. They have a meeting. What's the meeting like? Well, the meeting includes a 20-minute presentation, and then he announces that the Pritzkers have an offer of $55 a share. It's got some terms, million-dollar share lockup. It says there's a 24-hour deadline. Whew. Why? What's the emergency here? Was this a real emergency? Was it a manufactured emergency? Now, again, these are not easily duped people, so don't just think they're being fooled. On the other hand, Something went wrong here. What's with the 24 hours? What's a justification that you would need to get this deal done in 24 hours? If it's 24 hours, it's not going to give you enough time for additional offers. The sale was for stock. And what happens if people learn the Pritzker millionaire, billionaire, is going to buy the company? They're going to buy the stock. They're going to buy the stock. And so you'll often find these type of deals have a really crazy deadline because you've got to get them done before it gets out. And you're going to want to do it when the market's closed because we want to get the deal done before the stock price moved, right? Because it was a cash stock deal. So the board asked for what's called a market test period. They say, okay, we're going to get into this deal. We'll lock it up at this price, but we're going to need to know what this company is really worth. How long did the board meet for? Two hours. I mean, these are busy people. They got other things to do, what have you. But there's a few things they didn't do in this two hour meeting. For one thing, they, they didn't read the merger agreement. They didn't read the merger agreement. I mean, there's lots of terms in a merger agreement. I, I get it. It's boring. Usually you might have someone like read it to you or at least tell you like the highlights. But you should probably get your directors to read the merger agreement. And the board should have asked some questions. Any ideas? Like they, Again, with two hours and 20-minute presentation, they obviously asked a few questions. What are some questions they might have asked? How did you come to $55? How did you come to $55? What is the actual price of this company? Right? And, and how did we get to that number? Yeah. That's a fundamental question. What's the real value of this company? What are some ways that they could have done better? Well, they could have gotten an opinion from an outside firm as to what the company's worth, not just ask the controller. A rail car leasing company, one of the largest companies in America, how do you know what it's worth? So some issues there. They, they do reserve the right to get this market test. Now, they probably thought this was a good idea because what can a market test reveal? Well, one way to know what something is worth is to find out what people will pay for it. So you can go and say, okay, company's up for sale. Can we get more than $55 for it? Now this turned out, obviously, right? We know the answer to the story. We can play the tape for it. This obviously turned out to be inadequate for, for what we'll call paper and process. Why? Well, what does the market tells tell you? It tells you after the deal is struck whether or not you got into a good deal. What does the business judgment rule require? It requires at the time the board makes the decision that it's informed. So the court found that here the market test, while it might provide information in the future, it did not provide information at the time the deal was struck. And you know, it was hard. 90 days is not a long time to go shop a company like this. There aren't that many people looking to buy companies like TransUnion for its tax credits. They talked to another private equity firm, KKR, which is still around. They talked to GE. Some of you may have heard of them. Trust me, there aren't that many KKRs and GEs. I mean, how many multi-billion dollar companies are there that have the cash and the need for those tax credits? So the market test wasn't all that effective. All right, what else did the company do that could have been helpful, that could have potentially solved this problem? Well, they asked the shareholders, what do you think? 
All right, so these guys, you bring them all in a room, you say, okay, we need you to approve this deal. And they did. What's the matter with that? The shareholders didn't have very good information either. First off, the market test was held to be inefficient or insufficient evidence of the price of this company. And it may not have even been complete. So the shareholders appro approved the merger, but maybe they were just following in line. They weren't very well informed, and so it didn't cleanse the transaction. We will talk about cleansing interested director transactions, called DCIT, director, director conflict of interest transactions, and cleansing those. Right? What information, again, could that have been? Have any experts been consulted? Are we certain this is the best offer we can get? How did the buyer arrive at that price? Ben Gorkum gave, gave it away. He said, hey, Control, what's the company worth? 55. Hey, Pritzker, will you pay 55? I mean, it's kind of a crap negotiation. Now, it might have been because if this company sells for 55, Van Gorkum puts a ton of cash in his pocket and walks away. Instead of holding a bunch of illiquid stock that's probably under a lockup period. One other issue that was happening, the kind that court brings out, is that the entire stock market was down at the moment. So someone with sitting on a lot of cash should really, could really pick up some good investments. Even so, even so, the trial court, following Wrigley, holds for defendants. Business judgment rule, the board's free to turn down the proposal. Moreover, that market test would have solved it. But here's the real reversal. So what happens on appeal? The directors lose. Business judgment rule does not apply. Van Gorkum's role in the sale as a conflicted director should have created some red flags. They shouldn't have listened to him. He's on his way out the door. He's been in bed with the Pritzkers. This is not, this is not Koch, right? What is the company worth? We didn't actually get a value. This market test period is after the fact. You weren't informed the time you made it. The controller, you're going to take the controller's words for $55 a share? What, what does he know? Right? He might be, you know, two-hour meeting with no notice. I mean, and, and what was the crisis here? The business judgment rule does not apply. And fundamentally does not apply because the decision was made without the board becoming informed. And the fact that they would have become informed later, maybe, by this market test, was not enough to, uh, to carry the day. Let's go back to the business judgment rule. Right? It didn't apply here. Maybe we can understand why it didn't apply if we understand why it does. What is the purpose of the business judgment rule? We're shareholders. Remember that chart? You can diversify away certain types of risk. Yeah? And so what you want is a company that's going to take risks. In fact, Delaware Law Section 141A clearly specifies the business and affairs of every corporation under this chapter shall be managed by or under the direction of a board of directors. And we want them to have that authority. Now, they're supposed to become informed, but assuming that they do, they're in a much better position. You saw those shareholders. Those, those are sheep. They showed up on a Tuesday. You know, whatever. They got like five bucks worth of stock. They don't care. They don't care. Let's put the directors in the boardroom. Let them read the merger agreement. Right? The deal's already been signed. What do, what do the shareholders know? They're not experts in this. But a director... Going along with that, that has a duty. The corresponding, the business judgment rule has a duty of care, a duty to inform oneself in preparing for a decision. And it comes from being a fiduciary. You're responsible for the company, and so you have to become informed. And if you're not informed, the duty of uh, the business judgment rule does not apply. Right. And Delaware General Corporate Law, Section 251, says it. Under Delaware law, a director has a duty to act in an informed manner in determining whether to approve an agreement of merger before submitting the proposal to shareholders. That duty was not met here, and so the board lost. Now, they did defend and said, look, we got a 50% premium over the market, and we had a market test which should have proven that this was a fair price. Now, once you start saying things like that, you're getting into a territory that we'll call entire fairness. We're going to cover that more after the break, what I mean by entire fairness. What you want as a director is to be protected from scrutiny. You don't want to say, this deal was entirely fair. 
Because then you have to go and prove what is impossible to prove. What transunion was worth had an entirely different set of facts occurred. You go in front of a jury, I mean, no one wants that. This was a high level of sophistication on the board. And there was a lawyer in the room who said, this is okay. I don't know what happened to him, actually. That'd be sort of an interesting part of the story. What happened to the lawyer, the Van Gorkum case? He probably had a really bad day. <laughs> and amazingly, I found a picture of Judge Horsey with a picture of horses behind him. How cool is that? <laughs> so here's Judge Horsey. And he held that the directors breached their fiduciary duty by failing to inform themselves, this is a direct quote, by failure to inform themselves of all information reasonably available to them and relevant to their decision and to recommend the Pritzker merger, and by failure to disclose all the material information, such as the CEO being in bed with the Pritzkers and getting a big cash out before he steps out the door, and therefore reversing and sending shutters through the corporate world. And yeah, it doesn't take much, right guys? No, this was a big deal that all of a sudden, this was one of the first cases where we don't have that business judgment respected. In fact, Judge Horsey, using more of his Horsey language, says that the shareholders were stampeded into an unadvised act, or the directors were stampeded into an unadvised act. The dissent said, you've got to be kidding me, dude. Look, Horsey, these were some sophisticated people. They don't get stampeded, right? These were major, major people. They're, they're not going to be taken in a fast shuffle. Here's how it kind of played out. The case goes back to the Court of Chancellery. They have an evidentiary hearing to determine the value as of the date of the decision. Wow. That sucks. How do you prove what something was worth a couple years later after all this press and stuff had happened? I mean, that's basically impossible. I mean, there is no such thing as 2020 hindsight. I, I mentioned it's, it's hard enough to determine what a company is worth now, but to go back and say what it would have been worth then had the world as it unfolded never happened, and doing it in a courtroom where the judge is already uh, uh, opposed to you because <clears throat> you stampeded your shareholders and, and took your directors in a fast shuffle. So... Uh, that, that, was not, that was not enough, right? So it goes back, and uh, an award of damages, but the damages would have been whatever the price was in excess of $55, whatever the fair price would have been. And that's what the company is gonna to owe to its shareholders. So what's the lesson? What's the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the corporate attorney to do after this situation? Well, one thing corporate attorneys began doing was making the directors initial every page of the merger agreement. I mean, that was really obnoxious. That, that has gone away to an extent. But literally sitting there and standing there, page two, page three, right, as if that was going to cure it. Although it did take more time and it showed that they read it and had a little, you know, what you saw is appearing in the lower right corner, initial here, initial here, initial here. That's not to prove that the document was really signed or was authentic. It was to prove that they actually read it and took the time. Right? We can call that paper and process. Right? Did we have enough paper? Do we have enough process? In order to make a decision have it protected by the business judgment rule, Van Gorkum says that a proper procedure must be in place and meticulously followed. And every step should be documented. Right? We sat down, we had a meeting on Tuesday, we had a meeting on Wednesday, we had a meeting on Thursday, we had a meeting on Friday, the initial page one, two, three, four, right? Trust me, life as a corporate attorney, life as a director of a board got substantially more obnoxious after this case. Question of whether or not that helped or not, I'm not sure. Maybe the board would have made the same decision, but they're at least trying to protect themselves. So in retrospect, we think, okay, you know, if they had met on a business day instead of a Sunday, if they had 72 hours, or 20, what would have been enough? It's hard to say, right? We know that this was not enough, but we don't know is what enough is. And so you see corporate attorneys in their risk averse nature freaking out and just doing everything parties eventually settled for a whopping $23.5 million. The DNO insurance paid $10 million of that, right? So uh, you can insure your directors against screw-ups, and you can insure them, you can screw, insure them really broadly. Uh, almost everything except a, a straight-up breach of loyalty. So DNO insurance paid $10 mil. The Pritzkers paid the rest, provided that the directors contribute 10% of their own liability so the directors did not have to pay for their liability, but were asked to pay 10% to a charity of their choice. Kind of a nice little twist here. The Pritzkers paid the bill and one of the directors to pay it back. And it turned out that Van Gorkum himself 
made a lot of those charitable donations. Academics are all over the map with this one. And some of them have really criticized this decision as chilling boards and causing them to go through a lot of unnecessary paper and process. So if you're interested in learning more or doing some research on that, I recommend the Cardi and Hymendinger uh, article on the topic. That's you now. That's you, corporate attorney. Uh-huh, do you sign page two? Now go back. I need you to spend 12 seconds at least on each page, you know. Uh, I want to be able to read that handwriting. Common practice to require directors to review a draft agreement, initialing every page, as if that's going to make them more careful. It's going to make them more annoyed, but I don't know if it's going to make them more careful. So, upshot, how do directors become informed? Review of written materials provided before at the meeting. Provide the materials in advance. Pay attention in the deliberations. No snoozing in your seats. And moreover, those deliberations should be substantial, especially in light of the size of the transaction. There should be a lot of data available. They don't necessarily have to read it all. This is part of the issue. I mean, if someone gives you a stack of 700 pages of analysis reports, how many of those pages will you probably read? Potentially none, unfortunately, or at least you won't read the right ones. I mean, these, as I mentioned, these are guys who run their own companies. Yeah? I mean, they do things for a living. They don't sit around and read 700 pages of financial disclosures for fun. So the problem with one of, one of the problems with the upshot of this case is that now you're inundating directors with so much information they may not read it. So the practice now is to give them that stack of information, provide them with a summary, and usually give a presentation of the summary to make sure that they actually heard it. But it's hard because you can't be reckless with someone else's money. That's the nature of being a fiduciary. That's why we began this with our conversation on agency law and what it means to be a fiduciary. How much homework? Not so sure. Uh, it's not clear, but we want to do more at least. All right, so we're, next topic will be avoiding director liability. Before we go on to the next topic, any questions, comments, thoughts on Van Gorker?